Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We're taking a look today at the latest iPad mini. This is the A17 Pro that came out in October. The reason why I am reviewing it several months after it came out is because I just bought it during the Prime Day sale and I thought I would share my impressions with all of you. It looks a lot like the iPad mini that came out four years ago, so definitely the bezels here are looking a little bit dated, but it is more powerful and it has more memory. And the reason why I got this is because I am taking flying lessons and I've been using an app uh, called ForeFlight on my phone, but I needed a bigger screen. And my instructor has an iPad mini along with just about every other pilot that I encounter. And ForeFlight is an amazing app that has all of your sectional charts. You can link in your ADSB beacon data. You've got your plates for all of the airports you visit. It is a really cool app that uh, replaces a lot of physical paper and so I figured it was a great time to get an iPad mini when it went on sale. Now we're not going to talk about ForeFlight today, maybe I'll do that on the aviation channel that I've been meaning to get started, but we will be looking at what this iPad is all about and what you can do with it along with its performance and my impressions of it. Now before we jump into this, I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that I paid for this with my own funds, all the opinions you're about to hear are my own. This is not a sponsored review, and no one has reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this new iPad is all about. Now the price point on this comes in at $499 for the base model. That's what I have here. I got a great deal on this. I paid $379, so I was very happy to get this at that price. These do go on sale quite frequently, so definitely check the affiliate links that I have in the video description because I am sure the price will come down, especially as we get into the holiday season and the back to school stuff. And you can sometimes go to the Apple Educational Store and get a better price as well if you've got kids in school. Now this has the Apple A17 Pro processor inside. This is the same chip as the iPhone 15 Pro phones. However, it has one less GPU core, which means graphically it's not as powerful, but it's hard really to notice the difference. And I'll show you some benchmarks in a little bit to see how it stacks up. This has 128 gigabytes of storage. It's good to see Apple starting to up the storage amounts on the base level units. And of course you can couple that with your iCloud subscription to offload photos and other things that might take up room on the internal storage. Now, if you want to spend more money, they've got additional storage options for you. There's a 256 and a 512 gigabyte version. They also have one that works over cellular networks, so you can attach it to your cell phone contract and use it when you are out of the house. But again, the one we're looking at today is the base model 128 gigabyte unit. That is good enough for me. The display on this feels very much like the old version of the iPad mini. It is running at a resolution of 2266 by 1488. Like all Apple displays, it is very nice to look at. It is very responsive here. What's nice about this is that even though it's not an OLED, you've got very nice deep blacks and contrast on the display. So everything looks good here, even if it is a little bit smaller than some of the larger iPads. And the reason why they call this the mini is because the display is smaller. It is 8.3 inches. For me, I can palm the entire thing in my hand here. Now, one thing that us tech nerds often debate is what refresh rate or frame rate should these displays run at for the best experience? So this iPad runs at 60 hertz or 60 frames per second. Some of the higher end devices can go up to 120 frames per second. And as a result, they feel smoother because the animation is smoother. So if you are someone who notices the difference between 60 and 120 hertz, you will definitely notice it here when you are swiping between apps or navigating things that use some of the system animation. It's not a big deal to me. I think if you've never really spent a lot of time on a higher end iPad, it's not gonna make much of a difference to you, but you will notice it if you're someone who's gotten used to the higher frame rates that you might get on the higher end iPhones. Now the weight on this comes in at 0.65 pounds or 293 grams. Like other iPads, it feels very well constructed with nice thick glass here on the front, along with a metal casing all around it. It is a very attractive device that looks pretty much the same as the prior edition looked. I did attach a MagSafe ring to mine here because I have MagSafe mounts all over the place that I use here in the studio. It's nice to just be able to stick this to something. And I also have a little knee pad with a magnet on it for 
uh, the iPad in the plane. So that is why you see that there. These rings are super cheap. You can get them anywhere. You obviously can't charge wirelessly through the MagSafe, but you can mount it to all the different MagSafe mounts that are out there. So it's fun to just stick one of those on the back. Now, as far as ports go, you don't get much on this one. Uh, there is just a USB Type-C port here at the bottom. This is a full service port, and I'll demo some of the things you can do with it in a minute. Now, this has stereo speakers on board, and Apple's pretty smart about how they make it work. So when you're in this orientation here, you've got your left side and your right side, no problem. But if you go to the portrait orientation, it'll shift the stereo orientation to the top uh, and bottom speakers, except left will come out of this side and right will come out of this side. And it does it so smoothly that when you're moving the iPad around here, it just continually shifts the direction of sound based on which way you're holding the iPad. It's one of those subtle things that Apple does exceptionally well. The audio quality on this is not spectacular given the small size of the unit. The speakers are loud, so you can definitely conduct conference calls and stuff on it. But for music, I would get some AirPods or Bluetooth headphones or speakers or maybe hook up a USB DAC. Uh, to the USB port and get yourself some lossless audio. But you do have a lot of audio options on here if the speakers are not a high enough fidelity for you. Over here, you've got your spot for the Apple Pencil. The pencil attaches here to the side magnetically and will charge through that little stripe there. This supports the second generation Apple Pencil. It also supports the USB-C Apple Pencil and the new iPad Pencil Pro. It does not work with the first generation pencil. Now in the back, you've got a 12 megapixel camera with a 1.8 aperture along with a small flash. This will shoot video at up to 4K at 60 frames per second. It does not have an optical stabilizer, just a digital one. But as you can see, the video looks great on this and is pretty stable for lacking that optical stabilizer. Although an iPhone, of course, will do a little bit better. It will also shoot 1080p video at 240 frames per second slow-mo. Now still images look pretty good out of the back camera. Although it doesn't support Apple's portrait mode, it does have a nice natural bokeh because of the 1.8 aperture. So you can see how detailed the flower is here and the background is sufficiently blurry uh, because of that natural optical bokeh. But again, no portrait mode like you see on your iPhone. But I am very pleased with the level of detail I'm getting out of the camera here. It really looks nice and on par with what you see out of some of the lower end iPhones. Now the front facing camera is located here at the top. The camera shoots at 12 megapixels for stills, but has a 2.4 aperture. So it's not as good in lower light situations. It also shoots only 1080p video at 60 frames per second max. It doesn't do 4K. Video quality out of it though isn't bad as you can see here. Now it actually does have a pretty wide field of view, so its default is cropped and zoomed. So when you turn it on initially, it's got a much tighter shot, but if you push this, you'll get the natural field of view of the camera, which as you saw is much wider. Now it also supports Apple's center stage feature, which works on video conferencing apps. So here I've got the iPad in a fixed position, but it's following me around digitally. So it's digitally panning and zooming the image here to track me in the shot. This only, though, works with a supported application, so it did not appear to work on the built-in camera app, but when I loaded up Zoom, which was what we were running there, it can follow you around. I'm sure there's some camera apps that can do that. So a neat little feature, you do have to be within the natural field of view of the uh, camera. It won't move the iPad for you, of course, but it does provide some additional ability to have you tracked if you want to walk around when you're on your conference call. Now, performance on the iPad feels great thanks to the processor that's on board. So some of the basic tasks like web browsing are very responsive here, as you can see. So you can very quickly render up web pages. You can jump around to different things and have those things pop up almost immediately here. So no issues with performance that I could see. It's got a pretty up-to-date processor now, so that certainly helps. You can go split screen on this too. So if I hit the split screen thing here, maybe I'll go into my landscape mode. I can have YouTube running on one side of the screen and my web browser on the other. I can adjust what the sizing of those two screens looks like and most apps support some kind of split screen mode. And then of course you can do that and go back to full screen. You don't have a lot of real estate to do that with here on this little screen, but it does uh, seem to work very well and I've had no performance issues 
browsing the web and pulling up videos and that sort of thing. Uh, this does support Wi-Fi 6E, so if you have an up-to-date Wi-Fi access point, you'll be able to take advantage of the speed that you have. This is what I got off of a speed test from mine a little while earlier. So all in, I think the basic performance of this for basic tasks is definitely more than adequate. Now, because this is running with the more powerful A17 Pro processor, you can actually do higher end applications like Final Cut Pro, if you can believe that. I was surprised to see that it would install on here and actually run, and it does. So what I did here is I downloaded their sample project and I was surprised by how quickly everything loaded up. I can hit play here and it seems to be playing back just fine even though it's a 4K HDR clip. So that's pretty cool. But if we go into some of the transitions here, I gotta remember how to get to them. I'm so used to editing with a mouse and a keyboard, it's really hard to do something smaller here. I can grab this transition here and just drop it in between two clips if it lets me. Let's, there we go. And I'll drop it in there and we'll see how quickly it can render this in in real time. So let's play that back. And there it goes. So pretty quick here to preview and render things in. It is certainly difficult to edit a video this complex on such a small screen, but you can do it. And I think there are a lot of applications that might lend themselves to this quite nicely. Final Cut Pro also has an app called Final Cut Camera that allows you to record multicam in real time where you can get all the cameras feeding in uh, to the iPad for managing the recordings on those other Apple devices. So there's a lot here that I think uh, those of you who do video production might find helpful and I'm sure there's other applications that can run on here as well where they really couldn't before on the lower end iPads. Now another thing you can do on iPads is run Apple's Keynote and I've got here a presentation that I put together on my Mac and I had saved it to my iCloud drive and what I'm going to do now is just plug in this external display uh, via the USB-C port and an HDMI dongle and in a second here the display will come up and right now we're just kind of mirroring things but if I go ahead here and play the presentation back, I've got a presentation display on the iPad. And as you can see here, all the animations seem to be working quite well. In fact, they run just as nicely here as they do on my Mac. So it's a great way to make presentations and you just need one of these dongles to hook things up. And because this is a full service USB-C port, you can get one of those USB-C hubs that output video and pass power back into the iPad to keep it charged and you can connect other devices like keyboards and mice and pointers to it. So there's a lot here that you can do uh, with an iPad even if you're not always making your content on it. And it's also a pretty good gaming device thanks to that processor. So this is Fortnite running. I got it running at 60 frames per second. It ran great on here at the default settings. Very, very playable. There's, of course, a very big library of games on the Apple App Store, and this iPad uh, will be able to take advantage of some of the more enhanced graphics that you might typically get on one of the pro-level iPhones. So all in, a very good gaming device. And on the 3D Mark Wildlife Benchmark Test, we got a score of 3,633. As you can see, that is right in the margin of error with what we got out of an iPhone 15 Pro Max that has a very similar processor. So the performance here is quite good. It's even competitive against the Asus ROG Ally, which is a portable Windows gaming handheld. But there is an asterisk here, which is that when this is under heavy sustained load, it does get warm and it doesn't have a cooling fan. So when it gets too hot, it has to throttle its performance back. And I did notice some variation in these benchmarks when I ran them after doing a bunch of system updates or after I was doing something strenuous on the iPad. So you might see some of your gaming performance drop off over longer periods of time, but it does have a good amount of capability here for the video editing that you saw and I didn't seem to see any significant performance reductions running uh, Fortnite for a good length of time as well. So just keep an eye on the heat. You might see a little variation in performance. Now, as far as battery life is concerned, you should get about eight to 10 hours out of this doing basic tasks like email and web browsing and video watching. If you are gaming on it, expect lower battery life, maybe four hours, maybe even less than that, depending on the game. But battery life on this did feel pretty decent it does charge up pretty quickly. They still give you a charger in the box along with the charging cable, which is something you don't see on the iPhone. Uh, so altogether, I am very, very pleased with my purchase here. I was not really looking to get a new iPad just because I don't really use my larger one all that much, but because of the airplane stuff, this kind of got me back into uh, the iPad ecosystem again. So I am eager to put this thing to work and see how it all works for me. 
My wife has been running with the uh, prior version of the iPad mini since 2022 or so, and she's quite happy with her. She uses it all the time. So if you like iPads and you want something smaller, this one seems very nice, and it's got a really surprisingly good amount of capacity to do more than just the basics. That will do it for this one. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching.